Welcome to another edition of the Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. And today, I want to welcome best-selling author and former National Speaker of the Year and National Speaker Hall of Famer. Am I correct about that? Yeah, yeah. Chef Mom's proud of that one. Yeah, Chef Hyken. Chef, it's so exciting to have you. I really enjoyed your book. Um, it was a great job. And I also watched some of the videos of you speaking online, which were also terrific. People should definitely Thank you. listen to you as a speaker. Thanks. So let's start with, um, give us a little bit about your professional background. Sure. So my actual first presentation in front of a live audience was at the age of 12, when I started my first business, a birthday party magic show business. And uh, that grew, and there's a lot I can tell you about that and the lessons I learned. But what happened is when I got out of college, uh, after a very short time, I realized I need a job. And what am I going to do? I saw a couple of motivational speakers, and I thought, wow, I could do that. Had the entertainment background. And by the way, I graduated from birthday parties to nightclubs and corporate events when I got a little bit older. But the point is, uh, I started the business with the idea, you know what, I want to go out talk to audiences and the area of expertise that I wanted to focus on happened to be customer service and customer experience. And the reason was were lessons that my parents taught me about how to drive that better experience. So that's where it all started. And uh, it grew from there. Who would have ever thought uh, back then it was just do a speech, get another gig, move on. And then I really started to learn and study and uh, because of all the clients I was working with, really a uh, hundred clients a year uh, in, in many years. And uh, it just, it happened. And uh, here we are 38 years later. I know I don't look that old. <laughs> here we go. Now, and, 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 and you've written a few books, but the book uh, that we're focused on today is focused on customer service. Well, why did you write this particular book? Sure. So all of my books are on customer service and experience. I stayed in that lane from the very, very beginning. So this book, um, I was approached, uh, you're referring to Cult of the Customer, yes? Yes, of course. Yeah. So I was approached about maybe 12 years or so ago, maybe 14 years ago by Wiley, John Wiley and Sons, which was the second largest publisher in the world. And they said, we'd like to publish a book. I'd already written two books. And so I had this idea, it was going to be called the customer focus, and it was going to tie into my brand on my training program. So uh, I wrote this manuscript, they loved it, and they changed the name to cult of the customer. And which also meant that I had to change some of the, <laughs> the chapters as well, but that was fine. Um, and the book that you have in your hands is most likely the reboot of that book because we updated stats and facts and eliminated a few stories for companies that hadn't done as well. Uh, back in the day when I wrote the book, they were rock star companies. But uh, what happens over time, even one of my favorite books, In Search of Excellence, yeah. some of those companies today are not in existence. Uh, but at the day, at the time when they were written about, they were rock stars. So uh, I love the idea of helping clients. And what this book did that was different than my other two books prior to that is that um, it has at the end, it has all these exercises. These are the same exercises that our clients pay our trainers to go out and deliver in our full day workshops and training sessions for our clients. And we hold nothing back on this book. Uh, all the exercises help create that customer centric or customer focused culture. And, uh, you know, I'm very excited about it. It's a lot of content, a lot of ideas. Uh, but at the end of the day, the one most important thing, we want to create an evangelist, one that will sing our praises to their friends, their colleagues, and ultimately those people become our customers as well. Before we get into the book, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is that you're a Hall of Fame speaker and I've written six books. And when I first started writing, I thought that's what I wanted to do too. And I joined the National Speakers Association for uh, about a year or two. I spoke all over the place, but I found that I really didn't like that work. Um, and <laughs> you and, didn't and, like and, traveling all over. You didn't and, like all and, those airplanes and hotels, yeah, and those taxi and, cab rides, and delayed and, flights, and you know. And, and given this, you know, that speech over and over again. I mean, the one book I wrote, which did work pretty well, was called Power Networking, and people always wanted to hear that. And I thought that was the least interesting book uh, that I wrote. And but to go and give the same speech over and over with such great enthusiasm, 
Um, I think that's really tough. How do you manage to maintain uh, such a high level of performance? I mean, it's kind of like Pete Rose staying in the game for 70 years and getting 4,000 hits. Right. Well, uh, you know, we're all driven by success. And I, I think that's not, I shouldn't say we're all. I personally, I think many people are, we're driven by seeing and, and getting the positive feedback that we know we're making a difference. And sometimes in the speaking business, positive feedback is uh, applause, uh, the standing ovation. Others are clients saying, that was great. We want to hire you again. That's by the way, is the one that I like the most. Because <laughs> uh, I don't need to get a standing ovation. I need to make impact. And oftentimes when the client is asking me to talk to the audience, Sometimes the audience doesn't like what I have to say, uh, even though it's what the audience needs to hear. But to your point, I want you to think about these rock bands that go out on tour, famous bands that have these concerts that night after night after night play the same music. And what happens is when it comes time for them to do improvisation, that's where they get to break away from that you know, set process that they have or that set song. And business is the same way and speaking is the same way. In early in my career, I wanted to hone my speaking skills. So I really worked at doing the same speech over and over again. But when you have that speech down pat, you can start to improvise. I can talk to a client and I will do a client say in the hospitality industry, let's say I'm talking to a management group of hotels. Okay. And then the next day I'm talking to people on in customer support roles you know, working in, in support centers. I can do the same speech from the standpoint of content, but the nuances for that audience versus the other audience are so different. They'll go, wow, he, he, he wrote that speech just for us. That gets me fired up because the, 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 the bones are, the, are basically the same, but the meat around the bones, we're either cooking it a little bit longer, you know, changing it up a little bit, give them a little different cut, makes sense. Back when I did my magic shows, I thought I wanted to go to Las Vegas and perform. And I realized that they would give me 14 minutes. They would tell me that's the act we want you to do. There would be very, very little differentiation from night after night. And I said, that's like going to prison. Two shows a night, six nights a week, can't make any changes, can't improvise. So that's, uh, that's why I love what I do. And yeah, it, I will tell you, I've told that damn cab, cab driver story, I don't know, thousands of times. Oh, yeah, but we want to save that story. <laughs> Because uh, I, I, uh, I want you to tell that story when we get to that question. So let's. I'm OK into... with that, by the way. I, yeah. And I, it gets better over time. Uh, so. well, that's a great story. Uh, how do you define a business cult? A business cult. So yeah, because you talk about the, that. The it, cult the is a derivative word of. Right, right. It comes from the word culture. So cult is not a scary word. First of all, people think, oh, it's fanatical, religious related. But no, if you define what a cult is by its basic definition, it's a group of people that have a common interest. It, it's simple as, uh, hey, I might go, I play hockey on Saturday mornings with the same group of guys week after week for years. That, in effect, is a cult. And when you look at companies, uh, the cult that we want to belong is the one is in the one that is focused on taking care of the customers. Uh, the word uh, cult, I believe the Latin word cultus, and you can tie in the word culture. And there's a definition that includes nurturing and giving and respecting of others. I mean, these are all really, really good words. Uh, at the end of it all, cult is not a dirty word. It shouldn't be a scary word. And actually, the cult of the customer is the one that you want to belong to. And, and, and that leads me to my next question, which is, can you explain the five cults you write about in your book? Yep. And I'm going to do it in uh, almost record time. So, <laughs> and so uh, let me set it up that these cults are actually phases or, or uh, you know, uh, along the journey of getting to what I call the cult of amazement, which is the fifth cult. And that's where the, the customer is going. I love doing business with them. I want to stay doing business with them. So think about, you can, and by the way, they also work internally for employees coming into a company. You know, they're going to experience uncertainty. They're going to get into alignment. They're going to, you know, they'll get through all those, but let's focus on the customer for this. The first thing that happens is a customer decides, I want to do business with this company. And I call this the cult of uncertainty, because even though they've chosen to do business, they aren't sure how the interaction is going to work out. 
And it could be, I'm going in to buy clothes, I'm gonna go to a restaurant, or I'm going to talk to, or buy a piece of manufacturing equipment for my business, doesn't matter. You're hoping it's all gonna work out. That's why I call it uncertainty. From there, we're gonna move that customer into alignment. Once they start to do business with us, they'll understand who we are, our process, what we're about, our values. We wanna get them into alignment. Then we want them to experience what we've promised them. And when they do that, and they've done it enough, and that's the cult of experience, and they've experienced it enough times to know this is what they're going to get, it becomes predictable, in other words. Now they own the experience because they know what's going to happen next. They know whenever I do business with them, they're always gonna get back to me quickly. They're always gonna get whatever I buy shipped out within 24 hours. That word always followed by something positive, uh, it means that you're in that ownership cult. And by the way, the word always means you're in ownership. If it's always in something positive, now you're moving into amazement because that's what amazement is. The ability to give a consistent and predictable above average experience. Doesn't have to be over the top, blow me away, but it has to be consistently above average. So people say, you know what? They're always knowledgeable. They're always friendly. They always get back to me. They're always helpful. Even when there's a problem, I know I can always count on them, which by the way, the first time there's a problem, that customer goes from amazement right back to uncertainty until they see how well you manage that experience when there's a problem or a complaint or a mistake that's made. And then you zip them right back into amazement. And that's when they say, you know, even when there's a problem, I know I can always count on them to take care of me. Pre-COVID, you must've been super busy with airlines because they never <laughs> cease to amaze us how badly uh, they run their businesses. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know what? I think it's hit and miss. You know, I, I, you, there's an expectation when you travel a lot, you start to learn, you know, this is what it's going to be. Uh, there are definitely experiences that are better than others. And it's not because of the process. The process is there. If the people who are working the process choose to take advantage of what's there. I've had incredible experiences on airlines and then I can fly that same airline. And because of the person who is the flight attendant, or maybe it's the gate agent, they can destroy that particular trip as far as the experience goes. Uh, so that's, it, that's why it's so difficult. A company that has tens of thousands of employees, um, you know, I, I, I talk about creating the customer focused culture and there's a six step process. And one day somebody raised their hand and said, how you keep calling this the simple six step process. How long is this gonna take my company? And I said, well, how many employees do you have? He says, we have 35,000 in our company. I said, it's gonna take uh, four or five years, maybe six, when you wanna sign the contract and everybody <laughs> laughed. But you know, if you're a company of 35 people, uh, it's, it's, it can be, you know, you're almost changing on a dime if you need to. You can implement change and get everybody on board in a month or two. But if you are going to work with companies that have 35 or 50,000 or 100,000 people or more, it takes time to get all of these people and all of these departments and all of the regions and everybody into alignment with what your, your vision is for customer experience. Well, that brings me to a stat that you mentioned that you gave a stat that says 76% of customers say it's easier now to switch suppliers. And you wrote about the cold of uncertainty. You gave a great example about a fictitious widget company. Can you explain this type of cult? So what happens is, well, when you're in uncertainty, you don't know what you're going to get. And it's like, as soon as something that looks, uh, and, and let me go a step back and say, most likely that uncertainty is because uh, the experience it might be okay one day, then a little better than okay. It may not even drop to being bad, but the fact that it's dropping to average at all leaves you open and vulnerable for a competitor to come in and offer something a little bit better. And the customer says, you know what? You know, the doing business with them is okay. I'm never sure exactly, you know, uh, if it's going to be great or good. I'm going to take a chance on another company. And that's the fear that we want to put into companies right now is you can't be average, you can't be okay, and you definitely cannot be inconsistent because that uh, just destroys confidence. So consistency plus confidence equals potential loyalty. So what companies and brands have done a good job with this in your opinion? This is a great question. I'm going to flip it around and ask you a question if I can, and that is, Think of the most convenient and easiest business to, to buy from. Who would that be in your uh, mind? Well, I had to, you know, Amazon. 
Right, right. So there you have the bar, okay? Because, and what's amazing about Amazon is that you, you really, I mean, the typical person you talk to has never spoken to anybody at Amazon. They're one of the few companies that have gone completely digital, but create an experience that, that, that people love and it breeds confidence. And here's why um, is, and I know, I don't want to get away from your, your question, but I want you to understand the thinking behind it. If you, it, my editor in one of my books, I can't remember which one it was. I wrote a book titled The Convenience Revolution. Uh, this came out about two years ago. That book came about when my editor, and it might've been for the, uh, I don't know which book I was working on, but the editor said, why do you always use, you know, there's certain companies and certain types of companies you used throughout your books. And I started thinking about it. I, I thought, well, that's because they're just easier to do business with. And I wondered, huh, is easy to do business with important? And I started doing all this research and I went, wow, the companies that are easiest to do business with attract loyalty like no other company. And of course they have to have consistency in the experience, but ease was really important. So companies like Amazon, the moment, first of all, it's a self-service solution. You go online and you shop without a salesperson helping you out, but they give you all the reviews and help you do your own research. You can compare products. And then once you decide you're gonna buy a product, as soon as you place that order, the moment you say, okay, or hit send or whatever, or, or purchase, you immediately get an email. As soon as that order is shipped, you immediately get an email with shipping information. As soon as that order lands in your home, you even get an email sometimes with a picture uh, of the package leaning up against the door. What, what Amazon has done is they've created this confidence and it's also consistent. It happens all the time. That's not easy to do. And especially when there's very little human involvement with it. And by the way, uh, if you do decide you need help, there is a way to eventually talk to a human. You can't call them. You put your phone number in there. And as soon as you hit, you know, you, you know, the uh, enter within a matter of seconds, your phone rings and there's an Amazon support person. So they've nailed this. But look, back to your original question. And I want you to ask it again, just to make sure I don't go off track any further than I have. No problem. What companies and brands have done a good job with this? Right. I probably should have said exclude Amazon. Exclude Amazon. Uh, which I 100% love. I mean, I love the idea that you can um, walk into the car and I remember I forgot to get dog food and I pl uh, punch it in and up comes choices or I just renew with it. Or in the middle right. of the night, you wake up and you say, oh my God, I forgot to order this and just do it. I mean, I don't you, know how anybody can compete the against them. In the middle of the night, and you can see over my shoulder, I have my Amazon Echo. So I'm not going to yeah. actually call her out by name, but let's say her name is Alice. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Alice, I need more dog food. And Alice will say, it's actually Alexa. Alice will <laughs> say, um, you know, would you like the same dog food as last time? And you say, yes, I'll place your order. <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy. And by the way, let's, let's, and then I'm going to go back to which brands. Amazon came up with something called the dash button. Are you familiar with what that was? No. They had it for a couple of years. It looked like a doorbell, like that would be next to your door, except it was tied to a product like dog food or, you know, a consumable that you would order again and again, copy paper in an office. Um, you know, maybe it's dishwashing detergent. So you would place this little button next to wherever, you know, like if the dog food's kept in the pantry. And when you want a dog food, you would just go into the pantry and you'd push the button and the next day your dog food would show up. That's pretty cool. That's pretty convenient. And this is what they said. It's not convenient enough. That means you have to go in the pantry. Why don't you just say out loud, hey, Alice, I need new dog food. You know, again, that's Alexa. <laughs> so, and, uh, and that's exactly what happened. So they said, we're just going to make it even easier. I don't know how they're going to make it any easier other than to, to put a chip in the back of my neck that's connected to my brain. And all I need to do is think I need new dog or more dog food. <laughs> and it shows up. All right. Brands that are doing really well. I love to talk about the Ritz Carlton. The reason is, is aside from all of what drives that iconic service that they have, it all starts with their uh, main statement. I call it a mantra one sentence long or less. And it's nine words in their case, we're ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And everybody that comes to the Ritz to work there understands it, they're trained to it, and they have all these standards uh, that, that drive it. 
So I can list brand after brand after brand, but you know, you can even go to the local shoe repair service that you have. Why do you love the person that's there? You know, the husband and wife or just somebody that works there. You know, why do you go to a particular store that you might love? You know, Nordstrom, famous for their service. I, I mean, Ace Hardware, one of my favorite companies to write about. I actually wrote an entire book called uh, where they were the entire case study because everybody knows what Ace Hardware is. They're, and by the way, they're in 76 countries around the world. Not always with the Ace Hardware name, but that's a lot, 4,600 stores, approximately 76 countries. Anyway, you know, their whole idea is we want to be the helpful hardware place. And that's their mantra or their credo. And that means that when you come to a store, we don't just serve you, we help you. I'd like, I'd like to get some paint. Oh, that would be the paint department. And they may even walk you there and say, there's the paint department. That's what most places would do. Um, is there, do you have any questions they might ask? But instead, what they do at Ace Hardware is they get really specific. What are you going to paint? And will you tell them, would you like some suggestions? And they recognize there's mission shoppers that are on a mission that know exactly what they want. And there's shoppers that don't know or that they're social shoppers, but the ones when you ask, what are you painting? And then great, here's the paint. This is what you asked for. But before you go, do you have brushes at home? Oh man, I'm so glad you reminded me about that. What about a drop cloth? So that's the difference between helpful and just serving somebody well and taking an order. Uh, and one of the questions we have here from the listeners, Amazon sells physical products. Do you think one day there'll be an Amazon for services? I think they're already there. They, you know, I think their cloud service is probably a bigger profit maker than the retail service. I think they mean I, like for accountants, lawyers, oh, gotcha. professional services. Yeah, I mean, they're getting into, well, professional services. It, you know, believe me, we're all, even in the speaking industry, when are they going to get into the speaking business? What does that look like? Uh, we thought for a while they were going to get into the training business because movie studios were starting to create training products that would compete with folks like myself who've got you know, online, on-demand training products as well as our on-site trainers and workshops uh, that we do. So the short answer to that is I believe Amazon will get into everything. <laughs> they're in the right now they're, they're doing pharmacy. Yeah, you know? that's right. Yeah. yeah they're just, right. they're rolling that out. So they're constantly pushing and finding ways to build and build. One of the things that uh, I've always been curious about, and I'd like to hear what your thoughts on this is, why do you think some companies grow to cult status, but eventually lose their luster like IBM? I mean, I, I'm, I'm a 60. And you remember, uh, because we're close in age, when IBM had, you know, tremendous cult stature, that that was what everybody aspired to, to even work for somebody like IBM, and Anheuser-Busch, and Sports Illustrated, and Forbes, mm -hmm. Tab Cola, Pizza Hut, all these things were like super hot for a long time, and now not so much. Well, why do you so think I that still happens? think Anheuser Busch is, is pretty strong, and IBM they're just they, they evolve. So, by the way, one of the highest uh, what I would call um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, but a moment in my career came about oh four years into my career when IBM hired me to do a keynote speech on customer service at one of their events. I'm going, wow, IBM. So what IBM did back in the day when they started to roll out. Uh, computers on a more consumer basis, you know, was it, and by the way, laptops didn't come on. There were, there were large boxes and you bought the screen and you had discs that you had to put in floppy disks. Oh yeah. I had all that. Yep. Yep. So what they wanted to do is create a product where price would be as irrelevant as possible. Okay. And that is by the way, with, with their big machines and their small machines. Now think about that. What do you need to do to make price is irrelevant as possible. You need to have other things that are more important. What's more important? A fast response on a phone call. Uh, I need somebody to come out and fix my computer or an easy way to get it fixed. Uh, the service, you know, all the, the, the services, a lot of the soft things in that process are what makes price less relevant. IBM was a master at that. Now, over time, and, and think about what the major brands are that over time aren't as, as major as they used to be. That's because competitors come up and brands sometimes have a difficult time moving to the next level. That's why Amazon started as a bookstore. That's all they were. And then they realized we can sell more than just books. Wow. 
we can create a better experience overall if the customer wants this type of experience. And you watch them evolve over the years. Um, you know, it's so that's, that's what happens. And then they mature. Every business goes through four phases, startup, um, growth, maturity, and decline. They try to stay at the maturity level as much as possible. And what that means is even though they appear mature, they're continuously growing. I was just talking to somebody about the line from uh, the movie Shawshank Redemption. You know, there's uh, the, it's something like either you're going to start living or you're going to start dying. You know, you get a choice every day. You know, you are closer to moving forward or closer to moving backward. It's your choice. It's your company's choice. So um, I know there I go off on a tangent again, squirrel, but I think it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I, you look at Tab Coa, there was a huge cult following for Tab. Tab, I remember Tab. But yeah. what happens is, you know, then Dr. Pepper came along. I think that may have usurped Tab. But go back to that book we talked about in the beginning, In Search of Excellence. You know, I can't remember how many companies were in there, 50 some odd companies, 60 companies. Some of those are, are have disappeared. Delta Airlines was one of those companies. And for years, they were like, this is an amazing brand, an amazing airline. And then what happened? I don't know what happened, but all airlines started to sink in terms of customer experience. Delta is coming back. They're becoming that iconic airline again. Um, you know, I do business mostly with American Airlines because of where I live. They take great care of me. But Delta was in that, that, that In Search of Excellence book. And then they declined, but then they came back. I think that's really good when you can rebound because it's going to happen. You're going to hit bumps along the way. There's going to be a competitor that comes in and usurps you somehow, some way. It's going to happen. You just have to be smart enough to move to the next level. So that, that goes to five phases customers go through, which you write about in your book when doing business with a company and how can a company ensure not to trip themselves up after building a great reputation. So what are those? So, and we, we, you're referring to the five cults, yes, uh, which, yeah. we, which we talked about. But when the company trips up, it's how they recover. And I believe that that is the opportunity. That's like judgment day. That's the opportunity to prove why you, this customer chose to do business with you. And oftentimes when the mistake is handled well, then the um, customer actually has a higher level of confidence as if the problem had never happened at all. So remember, uncertainty into alignment, into experience, into ownership, into amazement. You want to keep them in amazement. And the way to do that is that consistent and predictable experience that's always at least a little bit above average. Uh, Domino's has made a great comeback. Oh, did they? Yep. Yeah. So what did, what did they do right? That, you know, I mean, if you had bought 10 years ago, you would have bought their stock at $4 a share. And now it's I like think I wish 400. I would have. And yeah, yeah. yeah. And I and I don't know I, if in any of the funds that I own, Domino's is part of them. But what happened is Domino's lost its luster. Competitors came along and offered a better product. And I believe when the new CEO came about, and I'm not a Domino's expert, but this is just, uh, I'm looking at it from the periphery here. Uh, they said, you know what, we got to turn it around. We got to revamp the recipe a little bit and we got to be open and honest with our customers and tell them we've messed up. And we need to tell them what we're doing to get back in their good graces. They were transparent about the quality of their product and what they wanted to do to enhance it. Not quality that it was bad quality. It just, it didn't have the taste and the excitement that some of the other brands were coming along with. And I think that helped. They also started to become very customer focused and look for many different ways to interact with a customer. Um, I can't remember uh, in one of my books, and I think it was the convenience revolution. I wrote about 10 different ways that you can buy and have a pizza with Domino's, you know, the traditional way of picking up the phone and making the call, but it, there's so many different ways you can connect by with, you know, with your Amazon echo, you can, you know, or your Google home, uh, you don't even have to pick up the phone anymore. So they started to become really uh, aggressive with their technology. Are, are you familiar, and, and could you answer this question for one of the listeners, how the experience and lessons of the blue, uh, the blue chip companies could be used uh, for, uh, could be used for small businesses? Sure. Well, so let's talk about 
This is a great question. And I just finished a chapter in a book that's coming out next year that has to do with how you ensure that you separate yourself from your competition. And part of it is using the big company or your most admired companies as role models. The first thing is, and I'm going to give you a process. And I think your listeners are maybe hearing this for the first time. I've never, I'm so I've never shared this before publicly. <laughs> Number one is you need to ask the question, why should someone do business with me and list out all the reasons and don't make it easy. Like, Oh, because we have great people because your competitor is going to say the exact same thing. But what, I mean, and by the way, it's okay to put that in there, but recognize that's really not a differentiator. Then I don't want you to look at your competition to compare yourself to them, but I do want you to ask yourself, number two, what is your competitor doing that you might not be doing? And if so, they're doing something, is it something you could be doing? And I don't want you to copy them. I want you to make it your own. Okay. So once we evaluate the, what that competitor is doing, number three is to determine whether or not any of that can work for your business. And if it does, again, do not copy. Now, I want you to look at a broader picture. I want you to get a group of people together and say, tell me about the companies that you love to do business with. Companies, it could be your favorite store, restaurant, whatever. What is it about them that you love that they're doing? Next question, as you list them out, is there any of these things that you love that can be brought into our company that we're not doing? And if so, you know, figure out what those are. And now you make your list and you have, you have a job to do. And when that is finished, you now ask yourself the same question that you started with. Why should a customer do business with me? And your answers are going to be better than they were when you first started. And by the way, that, that, that step where you're looking at all the companies you admire, it could be Amazon, it could be Target, it could be IBM, it could be any of those large brands, and it could be the, the shoe store down the street that has an amazing salesperson that's always taking care of you. One of the things I liked was the uh, genie story in your book about the most important thing are loyal customers and how important, I, I wonder this, how important is location if you have a great product with a loyal base? <laughs> I ask this because I used to eat at a Mexican restaurant in a strip center in a town, small town outside of Philly. And people would drive an hour to go to this very nondescript Mexican restaurant. So how important is, what's, you know, I always hear people say location, 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 but how important is that compared to yeah. royalty? Yeah, so let's, let's the, the genie story is worth telling because it kind of sets the whole thing up is uh, I, I, I open the book with the story about the genie who visits business plan and is talking to three entrepreneurs about their stores that they want to open. They all three want to open an ice cream store. And the genie says, normally I grant three wishes to one person, but this time I'm going to grant each of you one wish for a total of three wishes. However, when you make the wish, it has to be something that will help your business. Okay. Or, or be extremely beneficial. Can't remember the exact words. You're really pushing my memory on this, which is great, Mark. Uh, so here's what happens. The first uh, entrepreneur says, I want the best ice cream because if I have the best ice cream, you know, people are going to talk about my ice cream. And, and the genie says, I'm not going to grant you that wish because even with the best ice cream, it doesn't mean you're going to be successful. So oh, that was what the genie said. The, the wish must guarantee your success. The second entrepreneur said, I want the best location, 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 location. And if I have the best location in business land, people are going to know where to go to get me. And the genie said, I won't grant that wish because without uh, uh, that location doesn't guarantee you success. And the third entrepreneur thought for a moment before she said what she wanted to say. And that was, you know what I wish for? I mean, I'd like to have a good location and it'd be great if I had the best ice cream, but what I want are customers. I want a never ending line of customers outside my store, always wanting to buy my ice cream. And the genie smiled and says, I'll grant that wish. So without customers, and Steve Blank said it well, Stanford University professor Steve Blank said, without customers, you don't have a business. Hello, <laughs> of course you don't. So you can have the greatest product in the world. You can have the best location. It won't matter. People have to, people have to love that product and wanting to come back. And that always amazed me about this. Mexican restaurant that we would run into people 
from Center City, Philadelphia, driving out just to eat the food, and the food was spectacular there. Um, why do companies now? now so that money? that, by the way, does doesn't necessarily. It's not in total alignment with what we just talked about. But if you've got a a product that's so good. And it's and the experience around it is so good, because, by the way, if you went to that Mexican restaurant, no matter how good the food was, if they didn't treat you well, you probably wouldn't come back. Yes, a hundred percent. And you're right. The service right. was fantastic. Right. And so, we ha have eaten at places that the food was very good, but the service was so bad that, you know, you, you walk away. And a lot of chain yeah. restaurants get away with mediocre food because the service is so good. Yeah, they do such a good job of training their people that the food is adequate. The food is good enough, okay? But it's not like you're going to a five-star restaurant, okay? But you're going to get five-star service sometimes. And boy, does that make up for a lot. But I will say the best service without a good product, your customers are going to go find it. If the food was bad, they'd go find somewhere else to eat, even if, if the service was great. However, if the food's the best and the service is bad, they're going to go find a place that makes them feel better and feel more valued. So when you put the combination of the two together, and remember, a little better than average, not like over the top, but a little better than average all the time. And to give you an example, in the most simplistic form, Horst Schultz, the first president and co-founder of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel chain, he said, let me give you an example of what average service is. Employee walks by a guest, smiles and says, good morning. That's nice, it's average. To the Ritz, that's average. What they do is say, Good morning, Mark. And if they don't know your name, good morning, sir. See the difference? One extra word. That takes it just a tiny little bit better than just hello or a head nod. So that's what you're looking for. And when that's consistent and you're never or hardly ever dropping to the level of just average or satisfactory, you are potentially operating in that zone of amazement. No question about it. You quote a study that said 87% of respondents said traditional experiences are no longer enough to satisfy customers. Well, where do they have to go now? And is that what you're referring to just now? So was that from the ACA report? The, yes. Uh, okay, then actually that's our report. <laughs> if anybody wants to copy this report, you go to hiken.com forward slash 2020 for this year, 2020 ACA, Achieving Customer Amazement. So uh, the stat there, give it to me one more time. It was 80. 87% of respondents said that traditional experiences are no longer enough to satisfy customers. Right. Tradition means just good service. They want something more. And uh, many times that something more is they want it to be convenient. They want you to reduce the friction. If they call you, they don't want to be put on hold. If they don't want to stand in lines um, and they just want an easier experience. And I believe that the stat came from the section on, um, you know, what, because there's uh, like 60% of customers will pay more money for better service. And that number jumps to as high as 90% for convenience if that convenience includes delivery. Uh, now, remember, uh, just a couple of years ago, even pre-pandemic days, so just a year ago, delivery was kind of a luxury from anything. Did you get groceries delivered that often from the grocery store? No. no. Today, it's an expectation. And today, back, back in the day, like there are restaurants, they would give me free delivery. Today, they charge me $2 or $3 for the delivery fee. And I don't hesitate to pay it because it's worth it. I'll pay more. I know that's good. But anyway, the point is your customers are looking more for uh, an experience today that not only is, is a decent product, good service, but a convenient experience on top of that. Yeah, there's a, 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 a restaurant in LA that my daughter likes to take me to. And the food is fantastic. They have to do no advertising. But one of the great things I saw them do is that there was a long line of people that would end up having to wait for 45 minutes. And they brought out fresh bread uh, with oil to dip into while you were waiting to be take, uh, while you're waiting to be seated. And I thought that was great uh, because you're so hungry and you know you have this long wait. But yeah. they were catering to us even though we were sitting outside. Yep. So there's a great restaurant in um, in Victoria, BC or Vancouver. Uh, it's called Vijay and it's an Indian restaurant. And it's the best, one of the best in the world, they say, outside of going to India. 
<laughs> but uh, when you go there, they don't really, they don't take a reservation and there's always a wait and they are always walking around while you're wait, waiting, giving you little tidbits, appetizers or whatever. And I remember talking to somebody who worked there. I may believe it was a manager. And I said, this is brilliant. And they said, when people tell us they don't like the wait, they don't like waiting at restaurants. We said, you've never waited at our restaurant before. The waiting is part of the experience. I think that's fantastic. We learn a lot from uh, restaurants. A uh, question from a listener is, yep. what is your advice on marketing to find the line of customers for a high quality, expensive product or service? How should the marketing be different from marketing an average product service to high end ones? Yep. I'm going to say there's not a difference. Oh, well, of course there is with the words you use, but you are trying to attract a certain customer. And whether you're going in for the low price, mid price, high price, there's you're going to use the same process to get those customers. So no doubt the higher price customer is going to probably in this luxury brand is going to expect a higher level. And let me give you an example uh, with a brand that we can all appreciate a couple of different brands. Let's compare, oh, oh uh, let's go Gucci, Nordstrom, Walmart, okay? Uh, Gucci, Ferragamo, uh, the, these high, high, high-end brands where you're going to pay, you know, five, six, eight hundred dollars thousand dollars for a pair of shoes, which by the way, you can find those at Nordstrom too, but at, at Gucci and Ferragamo, they're all, you know, that, that's the norm, right? The expectation on the service experience is going to be different. And you go to Nordstrom, who's legendary for their customer service. You, you know, it's hard not to find a good salesperson to help you out. And their whole process works really well. Then you go to Walmart. You know, if you go to Walmart uh, and you look at the parking lot, it's filled and you start looking around, wow, there's a lot of expensive cars in, in the Walmart parking yeah. lot too. Even the discriminating customer who wants luxury recognizes the value that Walmart provides they don't, when they walk in, expect they're going to find a salesperson in every aisle like they might find at Nordstrom. They don't expect uh, a great uh, high-level service. However, they do expect to be treated nicely, which they do, which Walmart does. I mean, they, they, do, they do a very good job of getting good people for the most part. And that was the whole, you know, Walmart greeter, that was special. They had that for years and years and years. Anyway, uh, the point of it is, is I think that whether it's a luxury item or a lower value priced item, there's really, uh, it's just understanding the expectation of both of these customers and not just meeting it, but exceeding it. I will say with the super high end luxury that oftentimes the reputation of certain businesses is so high that all you have to do is meet them to delight and, and make the customer feel like, wow, this, this is amazing. There is a restaurant here in St. Louis, again, we're gonna talk about a restaurant uh, that had such a high level of, of uh, reputation with their service and their food that, you know, and by the way, that's always bad. If people say that movie is the best I've ever saw and you go there and go, that wasn't the best movie. <laughs> well, same thing, the food's the best, the service is the best, but you know what? consistently this restaurant had people walking out saying, you know what? They said it was the best and it really was the best. I have to say one of the greatest uh, customer experiences I had is my girlfriend and I went on a baseball trip and we were in Chicago and we saw the Cubs play one night and the White Sox play another night. And what a difference between the two stadiums and how they're operated. At the Cubs game, people are saying hello to you when you're walking into the stadium and and the, and the ushers encourage you to walk around the stadium and they offer to take pictures of, of you with Wrigley Field behind you. I mean, it really, they go above and beyond. Even the food, everything was amazing. Then the next night we went to the White Sox and it was like going to a prison. Uh, the only thing I was missing was an orange jumpsuit. They wouldn't even let you walk into other parts of the stadium. They made you sit and always stay in the section that you bought the ticket for. And the whole experience was a 180 degree difference between the amazing uh, experience with the Cubs and the really horrible experience with the White Sox. Uh, beautiful stadium, uh, and that was it. So it was a gorgeous stadium, but it, from the moment you got off of the, um, the train, uh, 
it was a negative experience through and through. And, well, and negative so compared to their competitor. Yeah, and, absolutely. And that's important because you were able to do back-to-back -back comparisons to see. And by the way, uh, you're the kind of customer that Wrigley wants to have, all right? And let's talk about Southwest Airlines versus Delta Airlines, okay? Uh, you know, how about the business flyer on Delta Airlines that likes the first class seat? And then they are, are told this flight you're gonna have to take tomorrow is on Southwest. And not only do they not get a seat assignment, they don't get a first class assignment, they gotta stand in line based on a number you get to go whenever you, and it's like, this business person is going, I like my first class seat. You know what Southwest says? We love you as a person, but we realize you're probably not our best customer. So go fly on Delta. <laughs> you know? and, and I love the confidence about that uh, because if you're looking for, uh, and, and Southwest, the model has changed a little bit, but if you're looking for value, you don't wanna worry about hidden fees and, and hidden fees aren't really hidden. They are transparent, but what they're saying is there's no added fees for luggage and that type of thing. But don't expect much more than peanuts or pretzels. I don't even think they do peanuts anymore because of allergies, yeah. but don't expect much more than that. You're not gonna get it. And if you go in with that right mindset and you know what you're going to get, people go, that's okay. When you go to Walmart, you know what you're gonna get. And that's why you go out there and you'll still see expensive cars going into Walmart because they love the price selection and the fact that the people are friendly when it comes to the service. For sure. Um, one of the questions the listener has is, what is your point of view about the world of business and customer excellence coming out of the pandemic? What will change and be new? So great question. Um, when, the pan when any crisis hits, and in this case, it's the pandemic that we've been experiencing since about March 13th here in the U.S. I know in other parts of the world, it actually was sooner than that. The uh, there's a, a magnifying glass that's put onto companies. And what happens is the best companies shine brighter. And the ones that are lacking in the customer focus really seem to look worse than they actually are because customers are in a place where they want, uh, they want to be heard, they want to be understood, they, they like empathy. Just wrote an article comes out in about two weeks at the end of the year. My last article for Forbes of the year is, uh, and the word of the year is empathy, okay? And uh, and by the way, at the end, I, I and I do a whole article about empathy, but at the end, I just got to laugh because Mark, do you remember what you said to me? The first words that you said to me before I, and that was, and this is the phrase of the year, you're on mute <laughs> <laughs> or unmute your microphone. <laughs> So anyway, uh, but these companies, um, you know, back to the back to the question out of the pandemic. So the ones that were always focused on customers are going to probably figure out ways to stay focused on customers and excel in those areas. And as far as and I'm looking at what changes are are there, you know, a lot of what happened this pandemic uh, accelerated technology. A lot of what is being used today, and you know, like uh, we're now on a Zoom program. Well, Zoom's been around for years, but many people didn't use Zoom until this pandemic hit. And by the way, Zoom has become so popular that it's like, let's get on a Zoom call. Sure, uh, let's use Google Hangout this time. <laughs> they, you know, it's like Zoom has become Kleenex. <laughs> yeah, I'm Google going. Yeah, yeah, and and Google it. You know, you don't have to just Google it. Yeah, Google it though. Most people, when they Google it, they go to Google. Uh, still, they don't use the Microsoft program, or they don't. You know, remember Yahoo had a chance to buy Google for like some low number. Yeah. You know, you look at these companies that missed missed the boat. But anyway, uh, let's see. I'm, I want to go back to the question. I'm looking at over here. So what happens out of the pandemic is companies become customer focused even more than ever. Uh, it, there was a huge spike in customers that were calling for support where before they would just go online and try to do self-service on their own. But what happened is there was this emotional need to have a connection and talk to another human being. Because for the first month or two of this pandemic, I think it was probably closer to three months, uh, we were all in quarantine, so to speak, you know, volunteer quarantine. Uh, other than the essential businesses, so many companies shut down and everybody's working from home and they just wanted to talk to somebody. And so uh, companies ramped up and they made sure that they were there for their customers and some didn't. 
Um, I think the customer, the companies, the retailers, for example, that are focusing on health and safety and have protocols. Look at Trader Joe's. Uh, the other day, somebody said, you know, it, it is a little frustrating to go to Trader Joe's, uh, but uh, the fact that they're more concerned about my safety and health than how many people are in the store makes me feel real good about standing in that line. Uh, by the way, uh, somebody asked about the URL for the 2020 report. Uh, it's hiken.com forward slash 2020 ACA for achieving customer amazement. And by the way, maybe you can send that to me and or put it right yeah, now. It's, on it's, the... uh, somebody actually, uh, Sergey, I guess, uh, yeah. has put in there hiken.com. Oh, you know what? Um, WP content. That's where I'll just go ahead and put it in there. Hiken.com forward slash um, 2020 ACA. Done. So let me ask you this. Why are healthcare insurance companies and Verizon so horrible with customer service and trying to get a live person to talk with? Well, I hope that's not the case of every one of those companies, but apparently the industry has, has been difficult uh, to deal with. And by the way, there are industries out there um, it, and government is considered an industry. Uh, your cable and internet providers, um, there's the banking, there's all these different industries. And actually, if I look at my ACA report and every single one of those industries, the customer's expectations overall have not been met. Um, let me see if I can find that stat for us. So I give it to you, uh, but uh, here we're getting to it. Yeah, on average in all industries, the average, uh, they fell short of expectations by 38%. And I actually, we, we, we surveyed over a thousand consumers, hospitality industry expectations were rated the highest and the expectations uh, that were met were close to the highest, followed by financial, food, healthcare, airlines, internet companies, transportation, airlines, um, you know, taxi cabs, sports, which surprised me that it was that low. And then government um, hit the lowest, uh, which, but if you look at the uh, University of Michigan's reports on, uh, it's called the ACSI, American Customer Satisfaction Index. Almost every sector compared to 10 years ago has increased in their ratings, they just aren't increasing enough. Yeah, and, and we see American cars, you know, at one point uh, Japan was crushing American cars and they had to pick up their game. I think a lot of it has to do with finance people wanting to cut as much of cost as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and that hurts customer service and the type of things that you stress with companies that make a, a huge difference. T uh, tell the story about the cab driver. I thought that was a great story in your book. Sure. I'll give you the, the very abbreviated version. And why that was a long, important. What's that? And why, why that was important. Sure, sure. So it was a long time ago and it was a taxi cab. Today it could be an Uber, but I walked out of the convention center in Dallas, Texas, had to go to the airport, look for a taxi cab, hottest day of the year. I'm wearing a business suit. I'm already sweating. And the driver who just dropped somebody off waved at me, which is like that universal symbol for, come on down, I'm going to give you a ride, right? Yeah. And he jumps out of the cab to take my bags. I had two suitcases. I'd been on the road for almost two weeks. And this guy had shorts, messed up hair, uh, was shirt was all wrinkled, um, hadn't shaven in what looked like a week. For all I know, he hadn't showered in a week. And I thought to myself, this taxi cab is a moment of misery because inside, you know, look at this guy, it's dirty and grimy like him. There's no air conditioning. And then he took my bags. He put them in the back of the cab in the trunk. I got in and I walked, I, I was blown away because it was cool inside the taxi cab and it was spotlessly clean, spotlessly clean. There was even a little bucket with ice and a couple of sodas on the hump there for me to take a soda. There were newspapers neatly folded. And when he finally sat down, he picked up a dish of candy off the front seat, turned around, offered me a piece of candy, told me the sodas were mine, no extra charge, take a newspaper, all for the same flat rate that any other taxi cab driver would charge from downtown at the airport. And I thought, wow. And, you know, this, this is a great experience. And on the way there, he asked if I'd ever seen this famous fountain. And I said, I think I've seen a picture. And he says, you've got to see it in person. And I, you know, if I had the time and I could tell he was very excited. So we pulled off the highway. I had a few minutes. He promised me it wouldn't take more than three or four minutes. And he was right. It was right off the highway. And the famous fountain at Las Colinas, these life-size statues of horses, actually larger than life-size statues, running across water and their hooves are hitting water and it's splashing up and it's beautiful. 
And I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is like just a taxi cab. And, and we get to the airport, it's $22. I give them a huge tip, couldn't wait to come back. And that's a great story by itself. Uh, but, and by the way, what's interesting, I found out after I got to know this guy, Frank is his name. He's been retired for a number of years now. But Frank got the, the newspapers he picked up from hotels that had extra newspapers. He didn't even pay for the newspapers. He said, even though I offer everybody a soda, like one case of soda lasts the entire week because not everybody drinks the soda. <laughs> so, but then the trip to see the fountain was just a little bit of time. And so the other two were amenities, you know, the newspaper and the soda. But time is something you give away that people truly appreciate. And the best part came four days after this first trip, when I was home in St. Louis, Missouri, where I live, opened up my mail and there was a thank you note from the taxi cab driver. And I thought, wow. it was such an impressive story. I, I have that framed. That note is framed on my wall in my office to remind us how important it is to always show in some form appreciation, whether you say it to somebody. So Mark, thank you for having me on the show. Whether the, you know, if somebody's walking away after an interaction, you're at a store and you're the cashier, thank you for doing business. Could be a thank you, note, could be an email, could be a text, but you're showing appreciation. And I just thought, what a great guy. And by the way, I kept going back and doing business with him for years. So I've got two quick questions for you and we have a few minutes left. You write about encouraging your employees to solve problems, but what if they're afraid of being fired? Because it's more than the example you gave of the cashier giving you a, a pass on seven cents you owed on a hamburger. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was on the nickel and dime. Don't nickel and dime your customers. Yeah. You know, it, it, so um, it's the culture. It's empowering your people to do what's necessary and make them feel comfortable. You want them to know how far they can go to take care of their customer. There's a line in the sand. Let me give you an extreme example. I, I can't tell you the name of the automobile manufacturer, but they have a team of, of just customer service, call them experts, if you will, that, and they sell this a brand sells some expensive cars. And if uh, the customer, at a dealership is so unhappy that they, you know, just, it's obvious there's a real problem. One of these team members will fly to the city and meet with the customer to try to resolve the issue. Now they have permission to do whatever it takes to make sure this customer is happy, including refunding the customer, the full amount of their car. Wow. How many times have any of these people ever given a full refund? And the answer is, zero, but they're allowed to if they have to. That's how well they're trained. If you hire good people and you train them the way they're supposed to be trained and you empower them to do a good job, you will teach them where that line in the sand is and you want them to go right up to that line whenever necessary. Here's my last question for you. How can you publicize all the recommendations in a way that your competitors, customers will see you as a better choice? How do you make that happen? You know, leveraging Number, all this customer service. Sure. So, so you're talking about your reputation. So you've got reviews. Every industry has reviews. Now, Yelp and TripAdvisor are obvious ones. But even if you're in some little niche industry, there's some there's some place that customers go to talk about people and the vendors in the industry. It could be at a uh, at a conference. So, but let's take the general source. Number one ask your customers for reviews. Say, hey, if you like this service, we'd love for you to leave us a review. And there's, that's a whole nother story we can get to. If they leave a review, good or bad, you must respond to every review with a quick little thank you, appreciate you doing business to, I need to resolve this, let's jump offline, let me take care of it. And then you come back on, you state you know, what you did to take care of it so that you see the customer sees uh, looking at these reviews that there's a, you know, a closure to it. Uh, if you get a good video testimonial or even a, a, a review, post it on your website. Let people know. Share the story. Just wrote an article called uh, Customers Love the Story. Uh, the, there's legendary stories with Nordstrom and Zappos and different companies. And customers love to see those in reviews and read about the stories. And by the way, employees love them too because they love to, to know that they're doing a great job. So tell the story share the story. Do you have an, an extra minute or so? I have two, two more questions. One of them sure. has nothing to do with your book, but this one probably does. 
how do you filter customers so you don't get the ones that are not the right target audience from the onset? Well, I think that's number one, that's a marketing function. Uh, number two is, you know, you must educate your customer who you are and what they, what you do. And just like I mentioned with Southwest, when they said, you know what, Mr. First Class Customer, we love you as a person, but you're not right for us. So you've got to filter. But remember this, you always want to leave the door open. So even if the customer is not right for you, or in some cases, the customer is just not right. You've heard that the customer is always right. Sometimes they're not. They're always a customer. And you must treat them as such with dignity and respect. And hopefully you leave the door open with any customer to come back when they know what the expectation is and you can meet it. All right, here's the last question. The four guitars. What's the story with these four guitars behind you? <laughs> Actually, if you go to my home, you'll see like a dozen guitars behind me. I love playing guitar. You'd think I'd be uh, better than I am with all these guitars. The reality of it is it's my hobby. It's, uh, it's something I enjoy. I do get to play with some pretty amazing people. I have played with some amazing, very famous people on stage, but it's not Such what I do for a living. It's what, oh gosh, I got to play uh, with uh, John Oates from Hall and Oates. I got to play with Scott Page, the sax player for Pink Floyd, uh, Kenny Aronoff, who's played with every single musical act, probably that, you know, Rolling Stones, Beatles, you name it, he's played with them all. Um, so I've just had a great chance to play with some wonderful people and I become friends with these folks. So that's, that's like my, my, the other side of my life. I, I also do magic tricks. <laughs> I went to college with Mike Amar. Are you familiar Michael's with him? a friend of mine. Well, I went to college with him. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, West great Virginia. Guy. Great guy. Yeah, he was amazing in school. Well, Still thank, you, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with all of us. We, I loved your book and thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. And everybody out there, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay amazing. Have a great weekend, everybody. Please stay safe.